are back again to dissect topical issues for a better society. Welcome to The Advocate on Plus TV Africa. Five panelists, five topical issues. No holds barred. We tell it like it is. On today's episode, I'm asking which way in Nigeria are we fighting or enabling corruption? In the same vein, Bolahan dissects a development pattern in Nigeria. He's saying that development is for the people. I have so much to say on that. And Chuka, on the other hand, will be appreciating our evergreen nature that we often take for granted. And Nafisa will be throwing light on compulsory tax compliance from small businesses, from a government that solely depends on oil revenue. Hmm, that's interesting. Liberals gives a breakdown of the ever-continuing price hike of fuel since the beginning of man. <laughs> well, make no mistake, we are change agents set to sow seeds of productive thinking and action for a society we can call ours. Allow me lead the way after the break. If corruption is a disease, transparency is an essential part of its treatment. And this brings me to my advocacy today. How the state enables corruption. Let's do the mathematics. In the book, The Man Died, Wale Shoyinka said, and I quote, The man dies in all who keep silent in the face of tyranny. Sometime in July this year, a video went viral. It was that of a broken man. In it, the man speaks to the camera, asking for help for private school teachers in Nigeria. He breaks into tears, wipes the mocos from his nose, fights to not betray his emotions as a man. But no, he's overwhelmed by emotions, his dignity in tatters. He's a teacher in a private school in Nigeria. His salary hadn't been paid since the lockdown. And in the video, his appeal centered on how difficult it had been to man up and take care of his family. In Nigeria today, there are many men like this. The federal government had just increased electricity tariff in Nigeria. Many homes still don't have prepaid meter. Therefore, estimated billings, a system whereby a PHCN official dashes you a fictitious bill, is the order of the day. In Lagos, just as a partial lockdown commenced, PHCN unofficially increased estimated billings in many households. Citizens forced to stay at home without earning an income started looking for how to pay almost double their energy bills pre-lockdown. Now, that the electricity tariffs have been increased at the same time with an increase in fuel price, many families will need to review the family budgets. And by the way, interest on savings in banks has been reduced. I put up a post on Facebook and someone responded, and I quote, I'll connect power illegally. This country does not reward honest people. I have decided to go for illegal connection where electricity is concerned. Being a good citizen does not pay in this country. They want us to be dubious. Now that's a sad commentary of the illogicality of governance in Nigeria. The federal government itself constructed that narrative. It is the country where terrorists are rehabilitated, given scholarships, and sent abroad while their victims are kept in pathetic conditions in IDP camps. Without an increase in wages to reflect the current realities in the nation, where would Nigerians get the money to survive? And now that schools are resuming, parents are frantically looking for how to pay school fees from the same fixed income. I mean, something has to give. If we do the mathematics for a level 10 officer in a federal agency, who earns 97,000 naira after deductions in a month and lives in Lagos. Transportation fares have doubled. An average civil servant living in Songwater and works on the island in Lagos spends 1,800 naira daily. Now multiply that by five days a week, lunch not included. It costs so much to run a home nowadays. And there's a max increase in the prices of staple foods in the markets again foods like gari, yam, rice, eggs, cooking oil. And from a simple market survey I did on Facebook, that was pretty obvious. Able-bodied men have lost their jobs and they've turned to what we call fine bara to feed their families. They are the COVID-19 casualties. And when the people look poverty in the face, their choices are limited, 
survival using devious unconventional means becomes most tempting. While other countries are giving stimulus packages post-COVID-19 lockdown, we are getting fleeced and poorer. No, this is not fighting corruption. This is enabling corruption. With the new fuel price, the rat race continues. We now have to pay more to substitute lack of electricity by the government. And so I joined the late Sonia Okosuns to ask today, which way, Nigeria? Which way, Mulam? Which way, Nigeria? An, an interesting uh, uh, climax to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the problem remains that of primary leadership, and then you also have the followership problems. They're not just enabling corruption. Um, the system is, the, the people that we say are enabling corruption, a whole lot of them are also corrupt themselves. So it's, it's a totally systemic situation that we have right now. And when the chips are down, the people with power put the monkey on the back of the smaller people. And that is what we are seeing. I, I, removing fuel subsidy, if you ask me, is a good thing to do. But are they doing it because they think it's a good thing to do? I don't think so. Our hands have been forced. The creditors have come to call and say, if you don't do this, I won't give you that money. We have had five years to remove subsidy, if we wanted to remove subsidy. So why did we wait until that creditor said, you have to remove that money? That's, 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 that's part of the problem that we have. And now everything has come together. Everything at the, at the same time. But well, Gulang, I want to ask him. Um, uh, at this time last year, the price of oil and the international market was, uh, was about 60, 60, is it 68 or 63 dollar a barrel? Right. And, but now it is 40, 45 dollar a barrel. Mm -hmm. So, so how, how come we... now that it's cheaper, we are paying more? When it was higher, we paid less. Now that it's supposed to be, if, if it is um, the forces of, you know, the market forces that is determining the price, really. Um, it is good to cut down on expenses when you're hitting um, recession. But expenses does not just mean the expenses of the poor who are already down and out. You cut down on the taxes and expenses of the rich. So you'll be able to sustain the essence of government, which is the security and welfare of the people. As we speak now, the presidential jets are still there. Even the president's daughter now fly them at leisure. As we speak now, our government officials, even not for COVID, the pay. they are still going abroad for Correct. treatment. During lockdown, um, lawmakers received brand new vehicles, none produced here. That's capital flights. Mm -hmm. As we speak, during lockdown, 83 billion went down the drain in NDDC, an mm -hmm. interventionist agency. As we speak, the Minister for Humanitarian um, Affairs you know, shared almost 300 billion, mm -hmm. and nobody saw it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As we speak, government is spending 136 billion to feed school children whose teachers are crying and not, yes. and not being paid. Mm -hmm. <sighs> And while these children were in school, they didn't see the food, not to talk of now that they're at home. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these are money going down the drain. Mm -hmm. And then you now say you have reduced interest rates to 1%. But that same interest, that same money, you collect my money and you give me 1%. And then you loan out that same money to me at 30%. And, and so you find it, I'm finding it difficult to reconcile. And then somebody says, until we build refineries, uh, that we must, um, we can't afford to build refineries. If you cannot afford to build refineries, are you going to leave your society to the vagaries of a currency that you cannot determine the stability? Chuka, what do you think? Well, I think that um, what has happened now is that in spite of everything, we've been saying that this government is inept and it has no leader in reality. Um, and thank God, he has shown us now that that's exactly what we have and that those who voted for this government in uh, 2019, um, quite frankly, um, did not read the 
the writing on the wall or, uh, or saw no writing on the wall because they were not informed or well informed. I don't know. But um, if only we could have um, some sort of um, uh, referendum to remove them before time, that would have been brilliant. <laughs> let's I mean, take, all this talk let's take of... Nafisa quickly. <laughs> Nafisa, are you there? Yes, I am here. Just been listening to the conversations. And well, this is my own opinion. This is the way I'm going to approach the issue. I think there is a very, very strong connecting line between wealth creation and corruption in itself. If you do not have a government that is very focused on teaching its citizens how to create wealth and building an environment where wealth creation is, you know, encouraged and promoted, we're definitely going to have corruption. We, we, uh, fall prices are going up, the electric electricity tariffs are going up, and yet our people are still stuck on a fixed income that is depreciating day by day. We just need to look at, for example, this is a very, very good example. I bought some stocks about a, about two months ago on Bamboo, US stocks. And, you know, my stock value went down. But because of how the Naira had depreciated, I still had the same, I have not lost any money. I still had the same amount of money in Naira equivalent. Now, how funny <laughs> could that be? If I can be going through that, imagine the civil servants who have to survive on less than 100,000 Naira per month with a lot of, you know, children. It's... If you do not have a government that prioritizes wealth creation, not just for itself, but for its corruption is definitely going to be like a, a trend of the day. Okay. There's no way around it. Okay, thanks, Nafisa. Well, for me, and then again, resident doctors are on strike. Who should we be worshipping, as it were, in Nigeria right now? Should we even be talking about them going on strike? But for them, how would we have managed COVID-19? And now they're on strike. Mm. Minister and is back at them. They, they waited Every for two months. Oh. Yeah. They yeah. kept back because of COVID anyway. They were very it's kind ridiculous. in that Just, sense. That's what it is. Ridiculous. Well, Chinua Achebe has said that Nigeria is what it is today because its leaders are not what they should be.